Hello, welcome to the next video of Code First Machine Learning. In the last video, we looked at the high level design from a 30,000 feet view. In this video, we are going to continue looking at the design, but we are going to go down and look at a little bit more details. So we had already taken a look how the project is structured into high level applications, which contain each one of the libraries and each library is its own independent DLL. Now let's take a look at some of the more foundational level libraries that we have, starting with the ML core. Now the ML core library or DLL contains some of the base classes that have some abstract functions and there are some concrete functions also implemented and those concrete functions provide some functionality that is likely used by most of the derived classes. So let's take a look at model base. Now, in the last video, we have taken a look how each one of these algorithms like decision tree has a build and a model. The model is the data structure that will contain the trained model that you have built using your training data. And the build contains the classes that actually builds your model. So this is where most of the algorithms reside. Like if you're implementing decision tree, there will be an independent class for a C45 or an ID3. Similarly, there will be a model for C45 and ID3. And these models, they derive from the model base, which are part of the ML core. So what is the model base defined? So as I mentioned, there were some abstract functions that have been defined and each one of the derived classes have to implement the abstract function. Let's take a look at this function called run model for single data. Essentially what this is saying, once the model is built and has been trained using the training set that has already been provided, we can pass it some other data, have the model run and run the prediction or the classification based on the input data that is provided. Now, obviously if you're implementing a neural net or a decision tree, the way you run the model is going to be completely different. So that's why this is defined as an abstract function. And then in a derived class, which could be a decision tree or a neural network, you actually implement the function. So, you know, we can't write a common function to run a decision tree as well as a neural network. So that's why the idea is to define this as an abstract. Same applies for save model and load model. Now, save model is the serialization routine where you just take a file path and you persist the model on your secondary storage or the disk drive and after serializing the model. Again, the serialization logic will be dependent on the model or the machine learning algorithm that you are implementing. A neural net or support vector machine will be much different than say from a decision tree when you're trying to persist the model. Same for deserialization. Each deserialization routine will be dependent on the model that we are trying to implement. But then there are some common functions like convert a 1D array to a 2D array. Now these are kind of data manipulation functions. Now some of the data manipulation functions we have incorporated at the base level in the model, but we also have a separate data management library. Similarly, you know, some functions like a get two dimensional array. So it returns a JAG 2D array. Now, one thing about arrays is uh, for the sake of efficiency across the library, we have used JAG arrays. Now, most of the arrays are stored in like matrix type data structures. So we could have gone for a non jagged array too, but having a jagged array makes it more efficient for the sake of parallelization and also for the performance as well as storage requirements. Now, one thing we have added is like a root mean square error for each one of the models. Now the root mean square error is used in all machine learning algorithms to determine how accurate or how good is your model. So that has also been incorporated in the base level class. So similarly, we have the build base. Uh, again, this is providing base level functionality for any of the models, the algorithms that are going to be building your models. So let's take a look at some of the common functions that we have. So we of course have the constructor. 
Now, one thing we define are some private variables. And uh, since this is a base class, we have determined, declared them as protected so that any class that inherits them can still access them. There's a common convention we are following anything with an underscore is a private. Now, this is a little bit of an old school convention, but you know, if you're working in the C, C++, C sharp realm, this is a convention that is more widely followed. And also for the variable names, we have been following a camel case kind of a convention where the variable name actually starts with a lower case. We are also following a camel case for the function names, but the function names start with a capital letter. Now this is different from say a Python naming convention, but in C sharp and generally on Microsoft development platforms. This is a convention that is quite common. So the max parallel threads is a base level variable that controls what is the thread level parallelism that you want to go. And we'll dive into parallelism uh, in the later uh, videos where we take a more detailed look at some of the algorithms. And of course, there's the training data. Now, again, this is a two dimensional jagged array, which basically represents a matrix. And most of the machine learning algorithms take this kind of data structure. And then we define some specific columns that this is our target column and remaining of them are the feature columns. And then we train the data uh, based on the with inputs being the feature columns and the target column is what we want the target value to be. We also write a verify data function. Now this is something that's going to be used by all algorithms when you're building the model. What basically is doing some, some basic level check, right? Like the training data is not a null variable and the number of, uh, once it's not a null variable, it extracts the number of attributes and the number of data sample. Then we have also have a main function where some other verification is done like the attribute headers should be equal to the number of columns in the training data and some other basic checks now one thing we are doing you know following the more modern practice or a design pattern of raising exceptions we are not returning like one or minus one values if there's an error we simply throw an exception if an error comes up and we have defined our own custom exceptions and we are going to take a look at that class so if there's an error and you raise an exception, any consumer who is uh, using this DLL responsibility on catching that exception and throwing an accurate message to the user, it relies on the consumer of the application. The goal of the libraries is to raise the exception with the correct exception, obviously with the correct message. And then your calling application can do anything with that exception. And this is a convention we have followed across, like even on the algorithm side. Uh, taking a look at the exceptions class, uh, as you can see on the right hand on the solution side, each one of these exceptions have been defined. So let's take a look at that attribute count mismatch exception. So no, this was actually on the build side. So all we are doing, each one of the exceptions derived from an exception class, which is provided by the .NET framework and simply this returns a specific string. So what we have done is all the strings that are being used across the libraries have been defined in a separate strings file within the project. So in this case, in resources.string message, if I go here, all the resources have been defined here. So in our case, like the attribute, what were we looking at the attribute exception attribute mismatch run model so this is the error the attribute count pass do not match the attribute count used for training the model so all of the strings that are being used have been defined in their own resource file and the benefit of doing this is that we can do uh, localization quite easily so this resource file can be converted to different languages so for example if i want to convert these messages to spanish i can simply create another file and use the same attribute name and then define the value here and the resource file will have a different name and when you're running the application 
the .NET engine will automatically pick up the correct file for that specific language. Now, obviously, when you are building a model, you have to include this exception class or have a reference to it in your project so that all these exceptions can be accessed. Going back to the ML core, there are some other classes that we have defined that you can take a more deeper look once you download the Dasmic machine running library. We also defined our interface for building the model. Again, this sets up a contract where any class that implements this interface has to have these functions. So each, when you're building a model, each class will have a build model function that is going to take this specific input types. Now you can obviously overload the build model class, but, and you know, if you want to have some specific parameters that some algorithms can require, but this is the basic that e at least each algorithm is going to require. Then we also set some parameters that control or tune the model when you're running it. And each model is going to have its own independent parameters. All right, I'd like to stop at this stage. Uh, I'd like to keep all of these videos short. And then in our next video, we are going to take a look at the design a little further and some of the other common libraries. Till then, see you then. And do not forget to subscribe to this series of videos and to the channel.